Welcome back everybody to this second annual Tortoise Climate Summit. And this is our second substantive session. The question that we uh, are addressing is can farmers fix the climate crisis? Now, given that our overarching question is, is a fair transition faster? You may ask, how does the first of those questions relate to the second? Well, here's how my thinking goes. Um, farming, agriculture contributes a very large share of carbon emissions. We just saw in the slides that UK farms account for 12% of UK emissions. Globally, this, the agricultural sector is responsible for a good deal more than that. Um, so if farmers can't help us fix the climate crisis, then we are, to use a technical term, screwed. And so the question arises, would it help to make the burden fairer uh, on farmers or as between farmers uh, and consumers? If so, how? What policies would help? And I'm now gonna sort of narrow the field of argument down to the UK. Is the UK government post-Brexit um, enacting and enforcing any of those policies? And to help us grapple with that question and others related, and then to take a step back and look at the, um, the regional and the global picture, I'm, I'm delighted that we're joined by uh, Minette Batters, president of the National Farmers Union of England and Wales. Hello, very nice to see you and thank you for joining us. And, and I was going to say you are a farmer in your own right. So um, I hope it's okay with you if we, if we um, devote the next uh, 45 minutes or so to the question in that way, focusing initially on uh, the, the UK government policies that you have to grapple with in your role at the, at the NFU. But I also am gonna quote to you stuff that you've written um, very vividly uh, about broader matters, including the, the war in Ukraine. But um, first of all, maybe you can set out for us, and just before we get stuck in, a reminder, please everybody else get stuck in. Interesting question about neonicotinoids, I've already noticed in the chat, and I hope we'll get to that, that kind of thing too. But Minette, uh, again, thank you for joining us. Perhaps you could start by setting out for us um, uh, how you understand, uh, what you understand farming's role to be in helping the UK get to net zero. Thanks so much for the, the opportunity to be part, part of this. Uh, and I guess, you know, for, for us, we feel um, this is a sort of incredibly exciting time, really. I, I would say it is probably the most important uh, uh, agricultural revolution to date in that we are in a unique position, really. We are a source of emissions, but we are also a sink. So we have the ability uh, to be able to do something about it in a, in a way that, that other sectors potentially don't have those same advantages. Um, so for us, you know, we have set out effectively three pillars of thinking. One is really focusing on climate smart agriculture, sort of efficiencies, if you like, ever better climate smart farming. So producing the same amount of food or, or more food in some cases, but on less land and importantly with, with less inputs. And the, the second pillar is really based on, on nature-based solutions. Yes, trees, but grasslands, hedges, sequestering ever more carbon, which is something that we that we really need to sort of turbocharge right now. Well, all of it we need to turbocharge. And the third pillar is, is really based on renewable energy. And we are working very closely with uh, a scientific group that is sense checking our thinking. Um, many people will remember, I actually, in 2019 at the Oxford Farming Conference, I said, you know, we felt so confident in this area that we were prepared to beat the government's target with the right policies. And I, I can't stress that enough. You have to have the right incentives in place to make these changes. We could beat the government target and we could get to net zero by 2040. 
So there's, there's real opportunity uh, for us to be leaders in, in this arena, but there are also, I think, enormous challenges right now that, that we have to overcome, but it is within the art of the possible, Giles. So, you know, that, that sets out the three areas. We're working with this, this scientific panel. We're also working with our own pharma panel across all sectors, across all land areas. Um, to really, I guess, bring this to, to life uh, and what it looks like. So I think we've come quite a long way. The, the missing link, if you like, at the moment is, is the focus on the policy thinking, the incentives. We know some farming businesses are, are already at net zero. We know that some aren't even on the first rung of the ladder. We, we know there is no silver bullet and we know this will be an iterative journey, but uh, I think you know that the world is is really looking now, and that war in Ukraine is is a game changer. We have got to look at a completely different way of producing our food. So um, I really wanted to face into this and say, actually, farming is not the problem here. Farming is the solution, mm -hmm. and that has been my focus on on pivoting everything into how are farmers the solution to deal with climate change. Great. Well, thank you. I mean that that sets out the parameters of, of the UK debate pretty clearly. You said the missing link is the policy thinking. That's a pretty big link, isn't it? I mean, um, the Institute for Government produced a paper on related topics um, the month before last. And I think um, I, I've got so many notes here that they're all over the place, but, but broadly concurred with what you've just said, which is um, that uh, we, we have been promised by this government post-Brexit, uh, taking advantage of uh, Brexit legislative freedoms, uh, a new emphasis on in environmentally um, uh, sound farming practices and carbon sequestration in particular. So there's that broad goal, and from what you say, you, you share it, but very little so far in concrete terms to make it happen. What? And in, and in the piece that I think I referenced earlier that you wrote for the New European, you, um, uh, I think pleaded is not too strong a word for a strategy. Are we, are we anywhere close to that strategy? And if not, what does it, what, what do those incentives that you just mentioned need to look like? Well, effectively, having left the EU, we are, we are starting uh, with a, a blank policy. So, Obviously, the government has been developing uh, an approach to public monies for public goods through the environmental land management scheme. We feel very strongly and indeed felt so strongly that we brought the whole industry together to develop a white paper on what a sustainable farming scheme could look like on the journey to net zero. And ultimately, it was, it was a points-based approach. It was incentivizing people to get on that ladder, but it was rewarding people who were halfway up and at the top of the ladder. So it was encouraging people to make those changes and make them quickly. So we feel that the sustainable farming incentive, which government has in place at the moment, does not go nearly far enough. There is not enough detail in the scheme and there is not enough profit for a farmer to want to base their business on that platform. So we felt 65% of the budget needed to be invested into that sustainable farming platform. And, you know, we, we really needed, I guess, to sort of revolutionise uh, across England. And, and when I say England, I think it's very important that we join up UK wide here. Um, climate change does not have, as we all know, any borders. So to start off with, in the very first instance, we, we need to agree uh, on, on, on a measurement tool, effectively, a soil analysis tool, not just for carbon, but you know, there is there is no greater investment a farmer can make than, than in their soils. So we need that agreement, and that is still not even that is agreed yet. Uh, and then we need to really look at a detailed scheme that will deliver primarily through the policy on what I said about climate smart agriculture. Now that is different sector by sector. It's different land area by land area. We have a lot of upland farming, two thirds of the UK is less favored area. So we grow a lot of grass, but we also have areas of the country 
um, which are very good for cropping. Of course, we don't grow enough fruit and veg here, um, but everything will come from the new policy. So I, I am frustrated, and I know many farmers are frustrated that at the moment, you know, that scheme is not fit for purpose. It's not well enough resourced, and it will not deliver uh, what is needed on sustainable farming to help with climate change at this moment. What do you think is the reason for the holdup? I think it's very simple, actually. We called for a delay uh, in capping of BPS in order to develop... I'm sorry, a, for a delay in what? Uh, the, to, the, the government in England has, the UK government, has committed to capping what was before, so the basic payment scheme, in order to establish a new scheme. Now, our concerns were the ability to deliver a new scheme. So we said, actually, we've got to get this right. We've got one chance. The government should pause with the budget that it has, develop a detailed scheme that does deliver on carbon neutral food production and make sure the resource is there. Now, the problem we face, I think, at the moment is they are trying to use the original delivery system that cannot deliver any more detail because it can't deliver any more detail. They don't want to put any more resource into it. So they have effectively put themselves between a rock and a hard place. But I think there needs to be much more detail, much more resource so that we really can deliver sustainable farming. Um, two questions then. Uh, has the Treasury given any indication that you're aware of that more resource could become available and which which minister or junior minister does, does this really fall to? If we were to pursue it as a story at Tortoise, who should we call? Well, I think, uh, you know, it, it, it should go across really every, every government department. I mean, you know, over 70% of the UK is, is a farmed landscape. And so it does predominantly sit within DEFRA. Of course, Treasury holds the first string, so that is incredibly important. But I think, you know, my nervousness has always been, this has to work, you know, if it's public investment, it cannot afford to fail. And the investment at the moment is primarily going into what are called agri-environment schemes. That is effectively about taking land out of production. So hedges, other important aspects, um, but it is not focused on effectively what is in the field. And of course, you know, you have to look at our infrastructure as well. I would say there is no point in a dairy farmer being able to pull down money to plant a new coppice if they have failing slurry storage. They should be dealing with the slurry storage first and then having the ability to plant a coppice or whatever those public goods might be. But we should be dealing with our infrastructure, making sure that that is fit uh, for the, the carbon neutral road that we are on in food production. Sorry, can you just explain the slurry storage bit? Because as, as a non-specialist, I'm not clear why that is. That's obviously clearly a problem for some people. Why is that? Well, so dairy businesses, livestock businesses, you obviously have to collect uh, the slurry, the muck from those cows in order to, to stop pollution. That is then stored, that is then spread and potentially actually needs to be spread onto much more uh, arable land to build the soil health. In some cases, you know, that is not fit for the modern world. We've also got the issues with water companies, with septic tanks. So, you know, we really have to take pollution very seriously now. And this should be a big part of the new policy thinking as well. Uh, you know, the journey to net zero, dealing with these, these legislative targets like clean air that the government has in place, clean water, you know, clean air, we are going to be able to need to cover our organic manures. You get into all sorts of challenges with planning permission then. So this is where the join up and what I talk about every department having a role and, and not least the Department of Health, you know, our diets. We know that our diet here in the UK is not what it should be, the pressure that puts on the NHS. So focusing on what we eat, on how we grow it, focusing on the nutrient density, all of these things are critically important. So I would say it goes across every single department. Right, thank you. In a second, I'd like, if possible, to come to Katie White um, from the WWF, who's um, commenting on replace, replacement for CAP in, in the chat. But first, I just wanted to come back to what you were saying. In the absence of a sufficiently detailed uh, set of policies, uh, and you mentioned um, 
uh, agri-environment schemes. Is, is that is that is what is that what is happening by default? And does it include the um, fields covered in solar panels that you see from trains? Give us an idea of what sort of um, scale it's happening on. Well, I think one of the, the challenges we face is the government has set targets on introduction of species. It set targets on taking land out of production. It set targets for nature, for biodiversity, and these are all critically important areas, but they are legislative targets. It has then set targets for house building. It has set targets for green energy. It has no targets for food production. And at the moment, food production is being left out. And mm -hmm. we feel that food production and the environment must be treated as one in the same thing. You separate them at your peril. So, you know, you have to be focused on, on food production being part of this. At the moment, it's left out. So you, you are seeing ever greater competing uh, focus effectively on, on land use. Um, we're still building houses on grade one land. We're still putting solar farms on grade one land. We should be putting many more uh, of our solar onto roofs. We should be putting in individual turbines so that farms can be ever more uh, self-reliant effectively. And, and, and that isn't happening. So that's why the join up is so essential. But the biggest problem at the moment is that food security is not being taken seriously and food production is not featuring in these land use strategies. Right, well, in a second, I'd like to come back to exactly that and the extent to which the crisis in Ukraine is exacerbating all, all those issues. But first, if we can come to Katie, um, can you say a bit more about this? This may be uh, exactly what Minette was just talking about, the, the kind of um, uh, the subsidies that you're talking about when you say we should be subsidising positive outcomes which align with policy. Yeah, of course. And just to start off to say that um, we work with um, the NFU and with Manette, and Manette's been great at putting this on the agenda. Particularly, I totally agree with Manette on the sort of comprehensive need for a cross-government strategy on this. It is complex. We need Treasury involved. We know big opportunity missed in the Queen's speech with um, the levelling up agenda, you know, that really needs to be looked at in that comprehensive sense. I totally agree. And we work really closely together with Manette on, uh, on trade as well. Um, which is another area that should be included. I guess we were disappointed with the NFU calling for a pause on these, you know, the shifted agricultural subsidies. We know that this is, you know, an area we do need to make decarbonize as well as make sure boosting biodiversity. Michael Gove announced it in 2018. We can all agree it should be going faster in the details. But in terms of the estimates are, it'll have a, if we do pause it, the expected six megatons of carbon that we were going to save will decrease by 50 percent. That obviously, you know, forgetting the half life in the atmosphere, but in terms of, you know, what's the plan in terms of, do you know, do you think, Minette, that we can double up, go up when we come back on? What's your plan or is, it, is that somebody else's challenge to fix? Or can the farming community step up to make up that gap that you're proposing in environmental terms? Minette, okay. Um, Katie, hi there. Um, look, it, uh, it was with a heavy heart, I have to say, that we called for a delay. And the delay is because the detail is simply not there. You know, the incentives to create those changes that are needed is not there. Now, their line will be that they can't deliver any more details. So, you know, our request is that we do not have time to wait. We have to develop the detail and we have to put the resource behind it to to help incentivize farmers to make those changes. Um, so it wasn't just wanting to hang on to what was there in the past. It was about saying, you know, we can't just start this journey without the detail there. And just focusing on, on agri-environment effectively is not going to make the changes in agriculture that, that are needed to create sustainable farming systems. So for us, it's about getting that detail in place. It's about policy incentivization and investment. You know, there are many things that the market is simply not going to, to pay for. And we really do need to focus, I would say, the policy thinking on uh, carbon neutral food production if we are going to get there uh, by our target of 2040, and the government's target of 2050. And I, there is no detail in the policy at the moment on net zero for agriculture. 
So, uh, uh, Katie, was there something you wanted to say in response to that? Oh, here we go. Can I can unmute? Sorry, um, I like your control of mute. But and I mean, I get it's a thing, is it though? But in a sense of if we wait for everything to be in line, I get. Uh, look, of course, we would all prefer to be in a better position to be starting. But there is ways of starting and gather and using that as gathering some of the information. I think it's just you know it, we it kicks the can further down the road for two years. You know, what's what's we've as I say, we were announced in 2018, it's four years later. Um, you know, obviously we would have liked to have started. And I mean they haven't announced a delay, they haven't agreed to that at the moment, but in terms of, you know, that's not something that we'd want the government to do. Uh, thanks. Yeah. Go ahead. They, well they they haven't, I mean Katie's right, they you know they have not listened to us and they are they are carrying on, but ultimately they're carrying on without any policy to deliver these changes. So we're we're still in the same challenge. Look, we, we absolutely are ambitiously working up what this looks like. You know, we have our pharma panel, we have the scientific panel, you know, we will be issuing an interim report by 2030 of where we have got to uh, with agriculture. But it needs everybody to play their part. And, and most of all, it needs government to be prepared to work with the industry um, and, and implement these policies that have already been pulled together. So the industry is up for this. But we won't do it by just focusing on agri-environment schemes, that is a certainty. Okay, so and just to be clear in plain English, your concern on behalf of your um, members, Minette, is that one system is not uh, abandoned until another one is in place that ensures, among other things, that your members are not uh, sort of unsustainably out of pocket. Is that right? Well, no, that, that change has started. So don't forget, this is England only. Uh, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland have said they want to stick with the status quo uh, until 2024 at the very earliest. So England has started on this journey. The capping is in place uh, and the changes are happening. Now, you know, there are many farmers that are not in agri-environment schemes. Um, it is, it is one part of it. We've been working with agri-environment schemes. We actually sort of led the way in the European Union on agri-environment schemes, but that's one part. We've got to be focusing on the sustainable farming and the incentives that are needed. Don't forget this rather torturous road, you know, soils were not even going to be included. So at least soils are going to be included now, but, you know, we really, really need to I think, put the bulk of the budget into the sustainable farming incentive, but we must develop more detail to go into those schemes because we are a very varied landscape across the country. And, you know, there is nothing in place at the moment on the horticulture. There is very little way of managing our risk and volatility uh, on the world market, which we're obviously on now. You see the situation with pigs, the ongoing situation in Ukraine, the skyrocketing costs. There is... There is not time uh, and we can't afford to continue without a meaningful policy. Right. And you've spoken of the overwhelming uh, or, or the uh, urgent need for more resource behind whatever detail eventually emerges. Let's talk for a moment uh, about Ukraine, which is ex exacerbating inflationary pressures because of food shortages, it can't get out of Ukraine to feed 400 million people because of the skyrocketing price of fertilizer because it's such an energy intensive process. And you boiled it all down in the piece you wrote for the New European. The current conundrum is this, who should pay for these unprecedented inflationary costs like fertilizer, fuel, gas, power, cardboard and plastic to name but a few. How many consumers can afford to pay five pounds for a pack of six tomatoes or 80p for a pair? Now, um, question, is this the time for a windfall tax on those making most money out of this crisis in order to help consumers pay precisely those prices? Well, I mean, the government has said no, 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 no to a windfall tax. And I notice now they are saying that, that they are looking at it. I think there are interventions that will need to be made um, for, for two reasons, really. Um, and the World Bank sort of summed it up uh, about 10 days ago when they said, you know, 
others across the world are going to have to up production if we are going to fill the gap that will be left by Ukraine, which feeds over 400 million people, and Russia, who has been very selective about who it wants to feed going forwards. The real danger is that if we see production contract, and potentially we're looking at double-digit contraction across all sectors, that will tighten availability massively, that will increase price further. So there does need to be a sort of global strategy of coming together to see how we fill the gap. We shouldn't underestimate, here in the UK, we have the climate to produce, many parts of the world don't. So countries like Eritrea are 100% reliant on Russian grain. The Middle East, North Africa, very, very reliant on those two countries. So it, it does need global leadership, but I think, you know, when I look at the gas market, we, we have a very unlevel playing field. And when I was uh, in Europe recently and I was talking to my opposite numbers, the LTO uh, in Holland, they are putting three and a half billion pounds, that's our entire budget, three and a half billion pounds into glass house heat source pumping. So, you know, there are things that can be done, but they take investment and ultimately our reliance on, on gas is, is unsustainable. Um, we are still reliant, the world is still reliant on nitrogen fertiliser. Now, the journey to carbon neutral, it will need to become less and less reliant and innovation and new R&D uh, will absolutely have a huge role to play, but it's not going to happen in the next 18 months. So, you know, the ability to be able to produce nitrogen fertiliser to make sure that we are not, not driving prices up even further because Russia has stopped exporting ammonium uh, nitrogen fertiliser two months before this war started. So there is, there is a nutrient gap and there is a yield gap. Um, you could say we're a wealthy nation, it doesn't affect us, you know we must make sure that wealthier nations are not pulling anything off of the world market and marginalizing the situation for other countries that are not as fortunate as us. So it's a, it's a perfect storm and we haven't faced into anything uh, like this before. And it is fundamentally, I would say, a, a war that is really based uh, on undermining global food security. Uh, do you see anyone stepping up to provide the kind of leadership required for the global uh, strategy you call for? No, I, I have to say I don't yet. When I was out in, in Europe, um, there are certain people in certain places. There are some people in the Commission who are very much focusing on this. Um, I think there are some people in the UK government that, that are, but not many and not enough. And certainly that global strategy, I mean, we, we should not underestimate how serious this is. I mean, it has all the potential to make the Arab Spring look, look mild and it, it needs action. You know, farming needs action a year in advance. You know, those, those crops that will be harvested uh, this year, the planting will start in the autumn. Those decisions are being made now. You know, farming operates always pretty much uh, five to 12 months in advance of the product effectively being on the shelf. So we, we need to act now if we are to avoid shortages. And it's it's quite an extraordinary coincidence that COP27 is in Egypt this November, which will probably be the biggest discussion, the most important discussion the world will have had on food production. Um, I mentioned earlier a report by the Institute for um, I'm sorry, I think it's an Institute for Government, um, urging um, the UK government above all to address the trade-offs uh, between uh, the, the requirements of farmers, consumers and taxpayers in order to square this circle um, that you describe. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the report reckons that it is, quote, difficult, if not impossible, to do so. Again, for... for um, <clears throat> People like me who are non-specialists, can you give us a, a little bit more detail about the kind of farming practices for which the incentives that you and Katie were talking about are required? I mean, um, you've mentioned the Sustainable Farming Initiative. Maybe the best thought experiment is to, is to look optimistically five years hence. What do you hope 
will be happening on uh, English farms that isn't now, um, that is both, that, that meets the needs of um, food security, but also carbon sequestration and climate more generally. What, what, give us an idea of that some of the specific farming practices that we should be looking for. Well, firstly, we, we need um, a similar commitment from the government uh, to the, the nature targets that it that it does want to uh, produce food here and that we don't want our self-sufficiency to plummet because, of course, we are striking trade deals uh, everywhere of food that is not produced to the same standards that we have here. So all of them wanted on trade is a fair approach and making sure that food imports are produced to those same standards. But we do have a chance for, for real leadership. And many people uh, on, on this uh, platform today will be well aware of the chlorinated chicken, hormone-treated beef argument. And fundamentally, that was an argument about food values and it was an argument about health. So chlorinated chicken is, is perfectly safe to eat. Um, the science dictates that it is safe and it is safe. But um, when I look at everything that we have done in, in regard to antimicrobial resistance, that's both human and livestock, it's been about ever better biosecurity. It's been about making sure that poultry cells have light. It's about being limiting stocking density by limiting the stocking density, by introducing the vet med oversight, by making sure that we have access to light, by making sure that we clean out between uh, every flock that is going in, that means that we are lowering and lowering our antibiotic usage. So whatever sector you are in, you want to see a better and better and better health status. Um, that's already come a long way in, in the last effectively 10 years since Lord O'Neill's report on antimicrobial resistance. So those are our, what I would call food values, and, and that is what we're doing in the UK, and there is no federal legislation in the US. So that, that is why that was unfair and not doing what, what was needed here. So we need to incentivize ever better animal health so that we are continuing to lower our antibiotics. That's about using effectively the best genetics out there for my farm at home, Mm -hmm. I, I want the two priorities for me are to use a bull that has an, an easy calving uh, index and also that has good growth rates. You know, every calf costs the same to feed. A sick calf costs a lot more to look after. So, you know, those are two areas, two traits that I would really be looking for. Those, again, can all be incentivized in a new policy. Feed additives, microalgae. Uh, probiotics. We know with the research that is ongoing at Harper Adams and in Canada, you know, microalgae is really lowering uh, our, um, our output of methane, but it's allowing yield uh, of milk to stay the same. So this is the climate smart agriculture bit. It's different sector by sector, but you can incentivize those changes. And in the arable sector, the cropping sector, you know, we want to look at ever, ever better GPS, precision farming, so that we are using smaller and smaller and smaller amounts so that we, we can step further and further back from very costly inputs. You know, nitrogen fertilizer now uh, has been, you know, very nearly a thousand pounds a tonne. Mm. These are hugely expensive inputs that are unaffordable. So to be able to use as little as possible and using it precisely, precision agriculture is key. So those are just a, a flavour of, of some of the changes um, that could be incentivised and why I refer to it as a ladder. You want people to climb that ladder quickly and you want to be incentivising them to climb that ladder quickly. Thank you. Um, I'll come in a second to uh, Gray Andrews. You've, re you've raised your hand, but I can't let this uh, easy carving index pass. Just tell us in a line what an easy carving index is. So you want the genetics, both the sire genetics and the maternal genetics uh, to be enabling a calf that can be born easily. So, you know, in the past I had uh, continental cows, I had Simmental. Simmentals are great because they are a dual purpose cow, they have a lot of milk, but you could very easily end up with one, you know, that has calves that have 
you know, big shoulders, a big front end, when they're being born, that can easily get trapped in the birth canal. You want a small calf, effectively, that can be born easily. We carve outside because it's much healthier, it's much better for both the mother and the calf. So I need them to carve unaided. There is nothing worse for me than having to pull a calf out. You want them to carve naturally. As soon as they're born, you want them to be up and able to drink. And then you want them to grow fast because, you know, we don't want to see as a, as a beef producer myself, you know, I want to be able to, we sell everything as stores, which means that that's not going into the finished trade. A finisher is buying it. But, you know, I'm producing uh, beef that we can produce off of grass. You know, we're not using any grains. I want it to be as efficient and economic as possible. I've really been focusing on that, you know, with these trade deals, thinking, you know, we, we've got to be as good as we can be. Um, so that's the, the carving index uh, for you. That's why that is so important. If you have a calf that gets stuck, calf can very easily die. Cow only has one calf per year. You then got it very, very costly. Uh, you know, you, you want that calf to be on the ground. Completely fascinating. Um, thank you. And uh, we're going to take that second step back in just a second, but I promised that we'd come to Gray Andrews. Gray. Uh, yeah, hi. Um, I talked to you the other day about, and we were talking about energy, but the similar thing comes in. Apparently, we waste about 30% of our food. So that's 30% of the 76% we're supposed to grow for ourselves, plus the 25% we import, we don't need. Right. We wasted. We need to, we need to carry the public with this. It's not just a matter of an industry like farming regulating itself, doing its best to become clean, uh, clean, uh, sorry, clean, mean, and green. It's you need the public to want this. I've worked on the hill farm in this country, growing sheep in Wales, farming sheep in Wales. A friend of mine's farm. Minette can testify to how much of a hard life that is. The prices of lamb in this country for Welsh lamb was like people, well, ordinary people couldn't afford it. So what we did was we shipped in meat from New Zealand. Yeah. That's great for climate. You know, shifted thousands of tons of meat into this country. Uh, we, we do, we're, we're not looking after the climate in the, in the, in the right way. Um, we, are, we live in a consumer-led society where people uh, are expected to buy more and more and more. What we need to do is use less and less and less. Uh, grow less, grow what we need. I mean, this is more about human need and human flourishing rather than do I really need a papaya salad? Do I really need bananas? I mean, looking at a uh, recent program I looked at in the Netherlands where they're growing so much stuff out there under glass and under lights in automatic fashion. I don't see why we couldn't do the same here. Again, this is the energy question. Uh, do we need so much red meat with him, uh, sort of um, uh, negative aspects as opposed to power from eating it? Great, that's, a, that's a really good point. I'm going to in interrupt you there because we're running out of time and I want to put that amongst other okay. things to Minette. I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, Gray uh, Minette uh, mentioned there uh, waste, but also uh, meat eating. You raise on your own farm, uh, livestock for meat. We saw on one of the slides, extraordinary statistic to me that um, that accounts for 85% of, of farming land in England and Wales uh, and, and about a third of the calories, whereas and the remaining 15% uh, account for the, the remaining um, uh, calories that, that, that are produced here. And we were talk talking with Jeevan about this earlier. Um, in many cases, if not your own, um, a lot of the animal feed comes from uh, places like Brazil with a very high cost in deforestation. Is it fair, returning to fairness, on the planet for um, the farming sector in the UK to continue to favor livestock rearing as it does? Or do we have to move big picture to a much more vegetable-based farming sector? vegetable and grain. It's, it's amazing to me how sort of misunderstood this whole argument is. I mean, we all, whatever age we are, we all need to be eating 
much more fruit, vegetables and pulses, whatever age you are, we're not eating enough and we're not growing enough either. But if we're going to be growing more vegetables, then we need to be looking at, at how we, we build our soil health effectively. And, you know, rather than a world that is focused on, on nitrogen fertilizer, I would like to see more grass, more livestock within a rotation that builds the soil health. I mean, you can't just not invest in your soils. That point I made at the beginning, you know, that is the most important thing that, that any farmer can do is to invest in their soils. Soil health is not a given. You know, you have to build that nutrition. Um, and you can do that two ways. You can do that through the chemical route or you can do that through the organic route. I mean, it's absolutely right to raise the point on food waste. We, we waste 30 billion uh, pounds worth of, of, of food. I mean, it's just, in fact, it's not, sorry, it's not 30 billion, it's 16 billion pounds uh, that we, we have on food waste. That's still a massive uh, amount. You know, we're not composting that. That's going into landfill. So we should be looking at all compostable products um, being able to, to be used to build our soil health. And the other point I would make is, you know, we grow grass here. We are not feedlot systems as they have in many parts of the world. So, you know, the focus has to be on, on the grass-based extensive system uh, whereby, you know, what we're not consuming here, we should be exporting to other high value markets across the world for people that can't grow it there themselves. The point I made at the very beginning about the Middle East and North Africa, they do not have the climate to be growing grass and to produce grass-based livestock and dairy products like we do. Now, there's a lot more that can be done and, and must be done with, you know, very expensive protein inputs like soya. You know, we should be building circular economies here whereby we are not relying on importing those proteins, growing more protein-based crops, you know, that would, that would make a difference. So that again is all part, I would say, of the incentivization of, of what needs to happen. But do not think that we will deal with climate change by just having less livestock. We need to have better livestock. We need to lower our emissions. We need to sequester more carbon, but we need to spread it further and build our soil health very much because we're using our organic manures much better than we have been. Right. Well, I hear you on building soil, soil health. Does that increase the unit cost of the food grown on it? And if so, and I confess I'm um, filching a, a question from a colleague here, what, what is a fair price um, with sustainable farming practices for a chicken? Oh, what is a fair price for anything? I mean, is it right that we can buy all of our veg to feed a family of four? at a price that is much less than one latte coffee. I mean, the value, we have devalued our food so much. And now here with the most affordable food, you know, in the whole of Europe, which is a huge success story for consumers, but A, we waste a lot of it. We've got to focus on affordable food, but we've also got to focus on a fair return for everybody in that supply chain. And you've got a situation at the moment with farmers where, you know, poultry, pigs, protected crop sector, tomatoes, cucumbers, aubergines, all of those, um, you know, potentially being produced below the cost of production. So what do people do? Well, they have to contract their businesses. All uh, the hatcheries out there are telling me that actually the hatcheries for our current poultry sector, you know, that they are putting down uh, less because, you know, the, the cost of producing eggs at the moment is so enormous, the cost of producing poultry meat is so enormous that you know farmers are contracting their businesses. So this is this is a very difficult thing to resolve. And really the only way you can resolve it is by intervening in that market and, and making that market work so that food doesn't get too expensive. It won't because the retail price war will keep it down, but you've got to keep farmers producing the same amount, if they contract, then we're in trouble. I mean, that last question, because we're in our last minute, do you think the British public is aware of how cheap its food is and um, uh, willing uh, long-term to pay a bit more for it? 
I think it's a story of two halves. I think we have an enormous and growing poverty crisis out there with people that can't afford uh, the cost of living. And that's a real worry as we go into the winter. And then I think we have uh, a demographic that that would be prepared to, to pay more. I, I think the real challenge comes in from my point of view. I want I want everybody, regardless of what income they're on in this country, to have access to high quality British food. And you know, I think that is that is a sort of fundamental right. And and what does that look like? I mean, you know, it's very, very easy to say food prices need to rise. That is an impossible conversation to have with the competition law that we have at the moment. You've only got to look back at the fines that have been issued to processors for trying to get the price of food to rise to give more money back to farmers. So we, we would have to look at things very, very differently. But I think, you know, probably the most important thing to do is to separate these things into social issues uh, and food issues. And we don't have a food strategy. The fundamental thing we need at the moment is a comprehensive food strategy. Uh, so that we really can make most of what we're best at producing here in the UK. We won't be growing bananas here, but we can grow many things. And in the case of fruit and vegetables, we need to grow many more than we are now. And that's where you need your strategy. And I'm appalled, amazed, shocked that we don't have one. We need one. We haven't had one for 75 years. And then here we are. We're still waiting for the white paper on the back of the Henry Dimbleby food strategy. Thank you so much. It's been completely fascinating, appalled, amazed, shocked that we don't have a strategy after 75 years at a time of, as you put it, a, a perfect storm in terms of uh, the need for food security and the looming um, prospect of food price inflation. Um, uh, and the public, some of whom are aware of how lucky they are, some in a position to pay more, some in, in absolute food crisis. Um, and of course, we learned about the Easy Carving Index as well, and many other details about climate smart agriculture. Thank you so much again for joining us and to everybody. It is uh, 3.22. We have eight minutes until, until the, the start of the next session, which is with Jeevan on climate damage, who pays the bill. Join us shortly.